I am Toya Kristen Finley from Schnudel Media LLC, and this is It's Not in the Writer's Manual, and this is a crowdsourced panel. So the content is based upon the questions that would, you would like to bring to us. Um, and I would like to start by everybody giving a brief introduction of who they are and how they actually got into game writing. Um, so I'm Chris Avalon. Uh, I got into gaming about 25 years ago because I was a pen and paper D&D game master because my players were really lazy, so I had to make all the stories. And then I tried to publish those stories, and uh, eventually on the 30th submission I got accepted. And then I turned that into an exciting career in game development because I could prove to somebody that someone would pay something for something that I wrote. So. Um, I'm Heidi McDonald. I broke into the gaming industry when I was 41 years old. Um, I was the oldest intern that Jesse Shell ever hired. Uh, the movie The Internship, I didn't have to watch it because I lived it. Um, my first project with them was an HIV prevention game, and if you want to be thrown into the deep end, try making HIV prevention fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, Orion Trail, our game, just got tagged for uh, narrative... Uh, narrative excellence by the IGF this year, so that was that was a, my big happy for this year. So welcome, thank you. Uh, I'm Evan Skolnick, and I've been in games for about 15 years. I kind of side slipped into games after having worked in comics at Marvel Comics and other companies, then working into in interactive development on CD-ROMs and websites, and then eventually just sl sliding over to game development. First as a producer and then uh, helping out occasionally with narrative because of my background, and then bit by bit doing more and more narrative and less and less producing, which makes me very happy. Hi, I'm Michelle Clough. I, I'll be playing the plucky newbie of the panel because uh, I've actually only been game uh, narrative design and writing for, I guess, maybe two or three years. Um, I got into it by actually meeting these wonderful, lovely people and then uh, getting me in touch with uh, my first client, which was a, uh, a visual novel game called 1931 uh, Scheherazade in the Library of Pergamum. And uh, I've also been doing a little bit of the lecturing circuit. Some of you may remember two years ago, I did a talk about male sexuality in games as well as how to write a healthy, um, diverse fan service, and uh, I'm also head of the Romance and Sexuality Special Interest Group for IGDA. All right, the other end of the panel, we have the other grizzled ancient of the industry <laughs> here. Uh, I, I am that terrible person who is, uh, first and foremost, was a game designer and programmer, and then was like, I can write this stuff too, watch me go. <laughs> Which usually is the nightmare of most writers and narrative designers. But I was lucky in college, I knew a couple of other college students who had dropped out and had started a little game company. And I went and offered to intern for them, and they gave me some programming work to do, and then I noticed they had a uh, game they weren't going to finish. Um, and I said, hey, I could finish that thing. And so eventually they, I finished it, and they let me take it and go publish it somewhere else. And that company was Bungie Software way back when they were two guys in their basement. So that was a great sort of introduction to the industry for me and game development in general. And I've always tried to do writing as well as, as game design when I've worked on projects. And a few times I've done only writing and then realized how little respect writers get in the industry and went back <laughs> to game design jobs. Uh, but now I am running an a independent project where I'm doing design writing and programming again uh, called The Church in the Darkness, uh, which uh, is going to be done in maybe a year if we're, all, if we're lucky. So I've been uh, writing and publishing for many years, and about eight years ago I wondered, uh, how do you get into game writing? Because I like games and I like writing and I wonder if I could do that. So I actually did a Google search for game writing, which usually does not bring up anything, but in this case, uh, the same indie studio that Michelle started with was looking for lore writers. So I started as a lore writer. They liked what I was doing. They made me an assistant designer, and at this point in time, I discovered that game design was a thing. Uh, so that was my start, and I've worked on probably about 10 projects now, PC, mobile, Facebook, and probably... Three or four of them have actually come out, and the rest you will never, ever see, but such is the game industry. So uh, with that, let's start with questions. Please just feel free to come up. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Is this thing on? Cool. Uh, so as uh, people trying to break into the industry, sometimes it's hard to know what kind of samples to send when you're asked for them. So uh, what kind of samples pool should we be working towards? Um, mostly in terms of like form, you know, twine, short stories, screenplay format, stuff like that. And uh, when we do work in screenplay with these writing samples, is it better to follow the sort of 
animation screenwriting where you explain more than you know writing for live action, things like that. Well, uh, first off, um, I'd, I'd probably choose uh, when you're applying to a company. I, I would probably study what type of games they make first. Uh, if they actually have a game editor and or, or a narrative tool set involved with their with their game design. Open that up, figure out what format actually that tool set uses for the, the narrative delivery. And if you're actually going to include writing samples, just tailor it for the, the type of game that those publishers usually make. For, so, for example, if you're applying to Bethesda, I mean, like, like study Skyrim, like study Fallout 4, see what the dialogue mechanic flow is for that, and then, and then just tailor your submission accordingly. You, you shouldn't have to explain too much if, you, if, you're, if you're following their general format, but and sometimes over-explaining can actually hurt, hurt your case a little bit, but that's just one piece of advice. I got a really, really good piece of advice from a friend of mine who writes for BioWare once. Um, her advice was to take a scene that has high impact in, in a game made by the company you want to apply for. So let's just say you know, that you were going to apply for BioWare. So you take your favorite scene in Mass Effect and you dissect it, dialogue line by dialogue line. It's going to take you a long time to have to go through all of those different times and find out all the different responses and where they lead. And you put a big string of sticky notes on your wall and you see what the structure is and how the mood plays out and how the dialogue plays out over the structure of that scene. And then just adapt what you're doing to the general structure that you already saw that they used. Um. I think, uh, I guess it depends heavily on, you know, are we talking about samples for, uh, you know, actually applying for a specific position, in which case I, I definitely second uh, uh, Chris's uh, point of view, um, or whether this is stuff for a portfolio website. And I think there, you know, a, a div you know having a diversity is, is really handy. Uh, having said that, uh, I got sort of my second big gig when I had nothing on there but like a couple Twine games and an RPG Maker game and a promise to myself that when I had time I was going to sit down and write some combat barks and the next thing I know I get this email through the website being like hey we're looking for game writers you know and I'm like okay I'm one I, I can do that well, the other thing is I'm coming from the freelance end. So a lot of times you have non-developers. Um, they're new to the industry or uh, they realize that they want to get their mes message out through a video game. And so they're not going to know to ask you for samples necessarily. And so in that case, I pick a, chew, a, a few choice samples that show like uh, character design, uh, dialogue, uh, maybe world building. So I give them kind of a general overview. And then I send that along and say, is there something that you need specifically? And so that'll give you direction as far as genre, tone, setting goes. So if they don't tell you, send something anyway, because you are more likely to get a response if you send samples, and if you don't, you may not. I think somewhere in there you mentioned short story, and, and I would... I would steer you, probably steer you away from short story or prose in general. If you have other samples, you can show that you're right, where you're writing for a visual medium. Because in, in nine out of ten cases or more, you'll be writing for visuals and not uh, more internal focus of, of prose. So a chapter from a, a novel you've written or a, a short story might not be the best choice. I mean, if that's all you've got, we can still when you when you do see one of those samples, you look at them and you can quickly tell within a few paragraphs what kind of chops the person might have, but um, it's not the kind of writing you generally do in games, so it's not as applicable as like a screenplay format, for example. And in general, I agree with what everybody said. I, I do like to see if someone does a custom sample for, say, fancy Studio X you're applying for, that's great. I always looked for another thing, too, to make sure that wasn't like the only thing they had, and they were one-trick pony or something. Um, but I agree that the other thing to think about is that the people reviewing these are probably reviewing a lot of them, so you want to have less is more, like just two or three things, like the custom piece and a piece of your own. And you want some of your own personality to come across in like that custom piece probably. So you can show, I can do work that fits with you. I can do my own stuff too, but it should be short. It should be like, I can read it in 10 minutes or something like yeah. that. I'd echo what, what, what Richard's saying. Like we, sometimes we get like 20-page like dialogue submissions, and that, that's... I, I don't, we don't need all that to determine what quality of writing you have or that you understand the structure of how a dialogue works. Like, and again, like Richard's right, like it, it just takes too long to read like a, a super detailed submission. Just put your best foot forward and just and keep it 
brief and condensed because that, that's also a good quality of a game writer, too. It's like you don't need to expound upon a, a certain subject. So. Thank you. Because you're going to have oh. dialogue limits, right? And you know, always, um, when I was... Words. Yeah, well, no, Make when I was work. doing um, dialogue for Lionel Battle Train, uh, we had to take localization into account. And so every single piece of dialogue that we have in that entire game had to be 110 characters long. So we were kind of telling our story in, in little spurts of 110 characters. So that will actually help you learning how to do things in a very succinct manner. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hello. Um, so I, I wouldn't claim to be a writer uh, myself. I um, am a game developer, and indie game developer. And my friend and I are in the early stages of planning out a narrative-heavy game, um, a sort of choose-your-own-adventure style um, experience. And we want to at least make a first attempt of writing it on our own, even though neither of us are writers per se. Um, and I know it's a lot of work, and it's going to be really tough to make it something that people connect to. Um, I'm curious if you have any uh, advice, resources for people uh, trying to really do something that might be uh, unique but need some basic concepts of how to write good dialogue. And also, um, if we do feel the need uh, later on to bring uh, a contractor in, a writer, a uh, game writer, what's the best format for someone to coming in later on, whether you know, to look at a rough draft or something like that and try to punch it up uh, what would be the best ways to, to work with someone like that. Well, I know a bunch of people on this panel have written books. Why don't you get, no, seriously, yeah. you've written books about how to do this. So why don't you guys rattle off the title of your books? Yes, so I wrote the game narrative toolbox with Tobias Hosner, Anne LeMay, and Jennifer Brandis Hepler, which is all about narrative design, just the writing of it, but also putting it into production with the entire team. So you can find that on Amazon. Yes. <laughs> Very good. My, uh, my book is called Game Design Theory and Practice. Uh, it has a chapter on writing and storytelling, but it's more generally about game design in total and the whole development process. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the book I wrote and came out last year is called Video Game Storytelling. Um, and it's, it's the first half is basically a distillation of the basics of Western storytelling structure seen through the lens of game development. The second half is aimed at different roles on a team and how you can apply these principles to development. But, but one thing you said uh, concerns me a little bit, and it seems like you're associating writing with dialogue. Like, you, we're going to write, we're going to make the whole game and the game story, and then if we need, and we're going to, then you have any tips on dialogue? Um, and dialogue is like the icing on the cake, right? The question is, how good is the cake, right? So uh, the t you ask the question when to bring in or how to bring in a writer, and if you're not confident about your abilities to, to tell a story, and yet you're going to structure it, and structure a choose your own adventure story game, story game. Uh, the earlier the better, is is my answer. Because if you bring a writer on just to write the dialogue and you've got a structure that isn't working, uh, then that writer they will not be able to help you that much. And that's a case that happens to game writers a lot as they're brought in uh, at the late stage just to write dialogue to layer icing on a, on a cake that was not properly baked, possibly. <laughs> we can slap some icing on it, but in the end, you take a bite of it, and it's you know, more like a stale Twinkie sometimes. So, yeah, that's yeah, so we, I would say the earlier the better, if you're not confident in your abilities, or at least be able to backtrack and, and give the writer the ability to come back in and work on your structure as well as your, your dialogue, yeah. which is the icing. To, to sort of briefly follow up on what Evan said, like there is a difference, it, you know, because at that point, in a, in a way, you would be asking them, like, yes, as a game writer, but also to a certain extent as, as a copy editor who may not be able to make substantive changes. So, you know, they might be like, yes, I can, I can do this dialogue for you, but here's this massive plot hole that would require, you know, an extra six months of development to, to fix. Um, and, and the thing is, like, you know, there are, there are definitely game editors that are, you know, that, that, you know, that is, that is an actual discipline and is very worth looking into. But if you want to really integrate it with the story as early as possible, like, yeah, there's a difference between game editing and narrative design. And as Evan says, earlier the better. Also, you were talking about hiring a writer. Uh, I would highly suggest doing your research on work for hire law and looking up uh, work for hire contracts. 
Also, please, for the love of God and everybody in this room, please look up professional rates for writers. A lot of writers do not know what professional rates are. <laughs> and when you understand what the professional rates are and you say, hey, I can actually pay you what you are worth and what your job is worth, you will get good writers. Um, you will attract bad writers if you don't pay them well. And I guess a final thing I just wanted to say, not to be too harsh, I guess, but you say like, oh, we're, we're not, you know, you're a programmer and maybe your friend's an artist or, or whatever. Um, and you're like, and we're going to take on this narrative game, but we don't feel like you're writers. On, why are you taking on a narrative game? I, <laughs> I mean, you should play to your own strengths first. You know, if it's like a, a first project that you're, you're venturing into or something like that, you should say, well, what can we do? That, what are we really good at? Let's play with that. And then maybe writing your or but if you really want to do a writing game but a narrative game but neither of you feel good about it yeah get someone immediately and it doesn't have to be much as I agree get a professional if you can but if you're on a budget you know look around the community for someone else who wants to go in as a partner with you or something who can be that voice for narrative from day one and hey. it keep oh just one thing keep in mind that you can do a lot with narrative without words. You can have a very visual heavy game that has a lot of environmental narrative. You would also need a narrative designer for that, but keep that in mind too. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. I wanted to avoid a lot of those pitfalls going into it, so thank you. Okay, good luck. Hi. <clears throat> this might be another buy my book question, but um, I am a very strong writer and I'm not a very strong game designer and I'm trying to become, you know, like you said, a game designer that also writes well. And I guess my question is how do you take it so that your writing is built around the mechanic more or less? What was that last thing you said? Um, how, do you, uh, how do you suggest that you take the mechanic of the game and, you know, use your writing to supplement that as opposed to the other way around? It's just a story slapped onto a game. Um. I kind of came at it from the same direction that you did. I came into the industry as having been a writer and never done any game design before. And so, you know, that's kind of where I was in the same place. And what I did was I bought The Art of Game Design by Jesse Shell. And I didn't just do that because the guy was signing my paychecks. It really was the most accessible, conversational, entertaining book that I found on game design. And I learned an awful lot from that. And you start to look at the story from different angles when you've read that book. And then when you're on the team that you're, that you're with and you're making this game, um, you're going to be in a lot of meetings. And during those meetings, they'll tell you what is and isn't possible. You know, if, if you've got this bit of dialogue, you know, about a guy who's talking about an ancient door that needs a key, but the artist is like, no, <laughs> there's some wacky reason that it can't be a door, it's a gate. You know, you just, you, you get that by talking to the other members of your team and having some understanding of what their constraints are. Yeah, I, I'd agree with Heidi. Basically, what you'd want to do is, is sit down with the system designer or the gameplay programmers or whoever's actually in charge of the systems for the game and just have them walk you through it. Like, it, it's, it doesn't require a lot of critical analysis to figure out what the core system, the narrative should be supporting is. So, for example, if you're writing a merchant for an RPG, there's certain implied system mechanics there, whether people actually realize it or not. One is, if you're talking to a merchant, the reason a player is talking to a merchant is because they want to buy and sell something. So don't have like 15 nodes of dialogue before you actually get to the buy-sell option. You're smiling, but there are some writers that still make that mistake. When you, when you talk to a merchant or you talk to the healer in town, there's a very specific system that you want from them. Don't let the narrative get in the way of that. And that's, and that's a really easy analysis to do. And then you can take that analysis and make it even more complicated. It's like if you're in like Fallout New Vegas, for example, and they're trying to reinforce the reputation mechanics in that game. As a narrative designer, you suddenly have an important role about how you're going to communicate that reputation mechanic in the game, which has a certain number of narrative conditional associated with it. Like, you'd have to have factions, for example, in order for reputations to work. Or, uh, obviously, the, uh, the people you talk to need to react when the reputation is low or high. And a lot of that stuff you can just find it by dissecting the systems, talking to the system designer or the gameplay programmer, and then figuring out how the story can support all of that. And actually, it's actually not too complicated once they lay it out for you. There's a, there's a lot of Excel and spreadsheets involved with that, usually, too. Yeah, I've already experienced that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. This might be a dumb question, but no, what exactly... No, no. <laughs> never say that. <laughs> What exactly is the difference between like a game writer and a narrative designer? 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Does someone have a uh, so, idea. So, so once upon a time, the Writers Guild Association uh, told me that we couldn't uh, submit work because we weren't labeled writers uh, at, at, at where I was working. And I, t- I took a little bit of umbrage at that. I'm like, well, I do a lot of writing, God damn it, blah, blah, blah. And, but, and then I realized maybe I don't do writing. And so I think the distinction comes um, – so a narrative designer, I think uh, the, the full job description for that is they're the guys that, that also know how to, like, script the logic variables. They know exactly how to implement the quests in the game and all those different stages, what sort of XP rewards they should be getting. And usually their range is a little bit more technical than, hey, we just brought in a writer – to take all the blank nodes for this particular quest and just write like two lines for each one of them. So it kind of depends. Uh, I, I generally prefer the term narrative designer because as soon as you're involved with an interactive experience, I think you're, you're doing a lot more than just writing, whether you realize it or not. But um, that's just my opinion. I, uh, the, the definition I've been working with um, for the most part has been that, that game writers, their craft focus is more on words and text. So, you know, they're, they're often doing the dialogue, the lore, sort of the plot, um, whereas uh, narrative design encompasses that but also can encompass, like, all the more... I guess, abstract ways that the game itself um, tells story, you know, things like environmental design, sound design, things like that. So a writer would be maybe, you know, their, their day might be like, I'm going to write this, you know, this dialogue, uh, whereas the narrative designer might be like, I want this area to convey a sense of foreboding. I'm going to go talk to, you know, the narrative designer to see how can we do that. Maybe we could have like a corpse hanging somewhere or something. That's how I yeah, differentiate it. I'd agree with Michelle, too. Like, uh, sometimes for, for games, uh, narrative designers would actually do like a visual storytelling pass. where They're like, here's the props that I need in this area to communicate that the following thing happened. But there wouldn't be a single note of dialogue or a journal entry anywhere around there. You're just asking, in tandem with the environment artists and the, and the world builders, like, how do I build this campsite so it looks like you know, it was abandoned one week ago, but clearly the turrets and the binoculars are focused at this distant location over there that I'm trying to draw the player to, and there's no talking about it whatsoever. It's all in the setup. Well, in, a, in a lot of ways, a narrative designer is a facilitator. Um, as Michelle was saying, the narrative design um, can help embody the world and the story and even the gameplay uh, in a lot of different aspects of the game. And so as a facilitator, the narrative designer is going to work with the level designers and the game designers and the programmers and the scripters and, and talking to them about, okay, how can we get this to come across in the gameplay? Or, you know, how can we get uh, aspects of the world to come through in the UI design? Um, to use Mass Effect, for example, the, the UI and the menu settings looks like a console of a spaceship. Why? Because you are the commander of a spaceship. So that's narrative design in just the UI. Um, you know, it can be sound. It can be art. Um, so you are really making sure, I like to say it this way, that the world and the story embody the gameplay. That's how I think about it. But you can look at any aspect of the game and apply narrative design to it. I like, I like all the... Sorry. I'm, I'm the bald white guy now. <laughs> uh, the the uh, sad truth is that all these things are true, but also defined differently at every company yeah. that you might interact with or work with. And some will not have narrative designers, and the writers will be doing the narrative design but not getting credited as that. Sometimes the narrative design is being done by the level designers, and the writers really are just writing the dialogue. You know, and it, it'll, Sometimes there are no writers, and they're all called narrative designers. What it, so it's really variable from place to place. I like the definitions I'm hearing. Is that sort of generally what happens? But you kind of, again, if you're like applying somewhere or something like that, you'll want to research, well, what do they mean by this? And it might be that you're applying for narrative design, and all they want to see is writing samples and they don't even talk to you about gameplay or it might be the opposite so yeah I, i've done a whole talk on this very subject back in the past without gda and uh, i would say that at a very high level first of all game writer narrative designer they both do both they have to uh, it's very hard to complete if you're a narrative designer you're almost guaranteed to be doing some game writing of some kind and if you're a game writer you're implicitly doing narrative design of some kind in the way you think about the story um, it's, it's almost impossible to completely extricate them from each other. And in a smaller team, one person will generally be doing all. But as you get to larger teams, we start to see them separated. And that's because I would say g- game writer is more focused on content and create the creative side of, of the, uh, just the story side more. And the narrative design is more integration and implementation. But they both have to be on the same page. And again, they both have built to kind of 
think that way. Um, but when you get a large team, you, it, it's useful to separate them to a certain degree so that one person can be that person in the meetings with the level designers and with the system designers, and the writer has has the ability to, to detach and focus on actually writing because it's very hard on a large team, a large project, to do both those things at the same time. To, to sort of you know wrap everybody's thoughts up, there the, one of the things I, I uh, one of the definitions I really liked for narrative design uh, is that you are the champion of the story, you know, the, of the champion of the theme, of the mood, of the narrative, and uh, so and of course you can be that as the game writer as well. Um, but I think you know for me narrative design sort of you know there's a connota- there's a sort of an implication of not only are you championing it within you know the writing sphere, but you're championing it for the entire team. You know you're you're working with the team to sort of say, like, here is our narrative goal. How are we all working together to reach that goal? Awesome. I was just oh. going to say that when I talk to elementary schools and they ask me, what does a narrative designer do? Um, the simplest answer that I tell them is, I'm the one who explains why the birds are angry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I just wanted, the point I wanted to make has to do with all the invisible writing that goes into game writing. Because every single thing that you see on a screen has to be described so that an artist can draw it properly. Um, There have to be documents that explain backstories. There have to be um, lore Bibles saying, you know, these are the rules of our world. So for all of the text that you see on a screen in the game, there's a whole lot of text that you never see. And we have to write all of that stuff too. So there's a lot of invisible writing that goes along with the game too so keep that in mind cool awesome thanks so much so uh, parts of this were kind of covered by the last part of uh, that answer and answer of the previous question but um how would uh game writers or game narrative designers market their skills or what they do to people who may not be aware of what it is that game writers or game narrative designers do or are aware of their importance Hmm. Well, uh, you point to Half-Life 1, and you go, once upon a time, first-person shooters were all just about shooting people in the face, but then Half-Life came along and added a story, and they saw it was valuable. It made a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there's a, if you're looking to convince someone of the value, is that what basically we're talking mm-hmm. about? I mean, there, there's a survey. I have, I have a link on my website on the front page that, that showed that in games with a story mode, that reviewers uh, are more concerned with the story aspect, the narrative aspect, than, than other elements like gameplay or art. Like, it's that important. It drives review scores. And if, there, if you want to try to quantify this and, and put it in dollars, cent, dollars and cents, you know, say this is actually can benefit your, 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 your review scores, which in fact impacts sales, I mean, it's right there, uh, it, you know, in, in kind of black and white and, if you're and looking for actual data. You could, you could also point to Telltale Games and go, well, apparently there's some studio out there that makes a lot of money just, <laughs> just telling stories in games. Like, apparently that's working out really well for them. So. <laughs> I would actually go, uh, I would do all of that, but I'd also go a slightly different route, and that is have a couple of games in mind that you can try out that are not uh, explicitly story heavy or what we would normally think of story heavy games. So, you know, for example, there's lots of people that say, oh, Five Nights at Freddy, that's not got much of a story. And I'm like, yes, it does. Here's, here's all the story that's in it. Um, or, uh, you know, or some other games that maybe don't even have any text at all, but you can point to, like, this is how the art. You know, this is how the art, the music, the, like everything combines to convey a mood or convey a story. And hey, narrative design is all about that. I think your best bet is going to be through networking when you are talking one on one with someone. And as Michelle was saying, you have your arsenal of examples. Um, you know, one I like to use is Plague Inc., which has a very specific story and has lots of dynamic world building, but a lot of people would look at that game and say there's no story and there's no world building. Well, yes, it's right in front of you. You see what's happening in real time. Um, So being here is really great. Uh, Try to find other networking events because, you know, there are a lot of people now who want to make games and you're probably in the position where you're probably going to be looking for work soon. So if you can convince them, um, and it's getting a lot easier all the time because they want to be convinced. They need, they know they need to make games. So listen very carefully to what they're saying because they'll probably tell you a lot about their project and based upon what they are telling you, grab an example that is similar to what they're doing. 
doing and explain to them using that example. Don't explain to them directly, here's how you, here's how you fix your game, because then they don't need to hire you. Um, but, you know, listen very carefully. Grab an example that's very illustrative of what they're trying to do. And I would just add, as sort of a cynical point of view on this, that if you're, I mean, it sort of depends on the situation. Like if it's your friends who are making a game and, and you want to tell them to convince, convince them they should add more story to it, I think you have a shot. If you're like going up to a team that's established and is working well and doesn't think they need story, like, they, I don't know. It, it can be hard to, yeah. to flip them. And if, you, if, you, if they say, well, I guess so, and sort of let you in to do some stuff, they'll probably end up cutting you off at the knees most of the time anyway because they never wanted story in the first place. Now this person show up. And, and I've certainly been in those situations on like big projects at studios where whoever was in charge of the project didn't think story was necessary, but someone told them to bring someone in, and then they can, can, you know, continued to undermine them for the entire process and say, see, we didn't need story. So you got to look at the situation you're going into, and is it possible to actually convert these people, or should I just go look somewhere else where it's going to be more receptive? Yeah, if you're, if you're talking with a team that, that you're trying to convince of the, of the value, you may, you may be talking to the wrong team. Right. At this and, point, and there's, there's so much evidence everywhere. Or they may everywhere. need to discover this yeah. by themselves, which they often do. And you may say, hey, you know, your game might be better if I, with, with some narrative put in here and here, but let me know if you need any help. And just let them go. And you may get a call right. <laughs> in six months when it's hit the fan and they realize that they don't. And could you just come in and write the dialogue? Right. <laughs> well, yeah. That's, that, yeah, but then next, maybe next time afterward, right. they will have learned their lesson. And you will say, I, you know, I can fix this dialogue, but you know, I could have done a lot more if I could change this and this, which I know I can't because you've already locked it in. But maybe next time I could help you earlier. And that's, that's kind of, you know, that, that may be a long-term relationship. But sometimes they have to, a lot of times, they have to discover it for themselves. They think they know how to write. They think they can handle it. And then at some or point... Or they think they don't need story at all. Right. Or they right. don't need story at all. And then someone says, this is really flat. doesn't feel right. What could help? Maybe a story. And then suddenly they realize that they're in trouble. And they call in someone like you or someone like us, to try to rescue them. And we do our best, but we have to explain that the reason we can only do so much is because it waited so long. And maybe next time they'll be one of those studios that does value what a, what a narrative person can bring early on. But, you know. Thank you. Hello. So, um, so writing is a process of iteration and reiteration, and that is important because that's, so in your endeavors, you want your writing to be as polished, as organized as possible. And uh, I mean, every writer has his or her own process when it comes to writing. So I wanted to ask you folks, you know, what is personally uh, the process that has proven most effective in your writing endeavors uh, when it comes to, you know, creative writing and, you know, uh, game writing overall? Uh, first off, uh, indicate the person on the team who's in charge of the story. They may not be in charge of the project, but that person is empowered to have all the authority and responsibility over the story changes, as long as it's in accordance with the game systems. Um, when there's multiple writers in the project, uh, make that hierarchy very clear within the writers as well. So they, all, they always know who the creative lead is or the lead writer is, and they recognize that they're actually trying to help that lead writer realize the vision for that story, and he in turn is trying to help the game realize its vision but he feels the story uh, is the best way to do that. Um, and the responsibility, uh, the lead writer would usually um, do the, 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 the drafts of the story uh, up into a point. Usually I find by the third draft, you either need to figure out what the strengths of that story are or scrap it. Uh, usually by the third draft, the lead writer has come up with we feel this is the appropriate spine for the story. Now let's reinforce it and, and build off of that. I would say have finite feedback windows because anytime you have a whole team of oh, writers Christ. in a studio, yeah, right. <laughs> oh, my God. If, you, if you've ever popped open a document that a hundred people have commented on, you're just like, I'm done. Yeah, like, exactly. there's, the, the, there's no way I'm going to get through this like, until, until a month has passed. And you're like, why is there a hundred people commenting on this? Like, Jesus effing Christ. Yeah, it's like, you know, marketing. Your, your time to, to look at this and, and give us feedback is between now. this date and this date. And then after that, we're moving with whatever you said at this time. They're just know? words. Can't you just reorder them? As you, <laughs> uh, no, but, but you, can, you can get yourself into a real situation because if people are making changes all along and all along and all along, it's like, when is this thing ever done? You have to reach a point. Because there is a release date, people, right? There just is. And you have to be willing to declare it done at some point. Even if you're not 100% happy with it, there is going to be a time when you have to declare it done. And so... 
um, assigning which groups are allowed to give feedback at what points and making those feedback windows finite and scheduled. Yeah, there has to be the, there has to be that cutoff point where the mutation has to stop, and yes. you're like you're like this is the this is the form you're going to take, and, that, and that's pretty much it. Uh, because I actually ran one problem in the studio where um, I I realized that every time I gave feedback, they'd completely rewrite the story. And at that point, I'm like, okay, wow, actually, feedback is getting really dangerous now <laughs> right. because it's not actually helping anything. Uh -huh. So I'm like, okay, well, we're just going to take this story right now. Don't change anything. Here's some very tiny specific things you might want to address, but you have, you have to watch the iteration process too, because sometimes people can just jump off the deep end. Uh, I've, I found process. Well, I mean, every game is different. Every team is different. It's hard to say there's one process that you could apply to all situations. But one thing I always make sure I do is really focus on, especially when I'm brought in early enough, is to really focus on the, the mechanics of the game and what is the core of this game and to play the game and to understand and to read the documentation on the vision for the gameplay. Because that's what we're trying to make better. We're trying to support it and enhance it and contextualize it. And if you just jump in with, well, we thought we were going to do this with the story, just run with that. And you don't stop and stop and back up and go, wait, what is your game? Show me the game. Show me how, how it plays. And then sometimes you need to take two steps back and say, you know what? This story that you've come up with doesn't match your game. This character you're talking about in the story isn't what you do in the game. So, and that's more of a narrative, more of a narrative design type of angle. But you've got, you kind of go, maybe you have to go back one or two steps, possibly. I found, and 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 really, with a fresh set of eyes, especially if you're coming in new, and say, you know, maybe we need to reevaluate where your story concept is, and let's match it better to what this game is really about, uh, what you actually do. So. So I come from the opposite end of the spectrum because except for two projects, everything that I have worked on, I have been the sole narrative designer and or game writer. So to stop the infinite feedback, I have very clear milestones and I have milestones for client feedback. And then I have milestones for payment that go along with drafts. So it's like, if you want more than two revisions, then you start paying me. Uh, for more revisions. And so with feedback, the, the, the feedback milestone, that says to them, okay, you only have so many chances to give me feedback to change things before you pay me. And so they know that feedback needs to be excellent and it needs to be on target. Yeah, I find that financial accountability really causes those <laughs> those comments to sharpen very quickly. And also, uh, if, if you're doing game writing, if, that you're getting feedback like from a publisher or another developer, it's always good to have one person designated as the sort of compiler of all the feedback from the studio, and that's actually specified in a contract somewhere. And I guess the one thing I would add a little different is I like to. I like the expression I heard somewhere that if you're putting it out there and you're not slightly embarrassed by it, you've probably worked on it too long. And I think that's particularly true in like, particularly if you're in a, on a big project that's going to have a lot of iterations and you need to like write the script for a level or something like that. You want to do a pass of it that's like pretty good, but not insanely polished. Not like every line agonized over forever because you know you're going to get around to feedback. And then it'll be really interesting to see. Oh, these are the things everyone didn't like. I'll work on that. I guess the other stuff is probably fine. I mean still go back and have your own polished pass to make yourself feel good about it, but don't. And also, as in the very iterative process, oh, sorry, we cut half the level. So all those lines you polished are now trash. So better to just get a good version out, get a pretty good version out there, but don't kill yourself on it, knowing that you're going to have time to go back to it. But if you've you know, got something like a voiceover session coming up, knowing, oh, God, I guess I better actually polish that now. So um, I'm still kind of working out my favorite iteration process because I'm new. So I've, I've worked on, like, in terms of the projects I've worked on, I've worked on everything from being the only narrative designer to being in a team where there's, like, multiple writers and none of us are allowed to talk to each other. Spoiler alert, don't do that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then the current team I'm, I'm with, you know, we have a, a, a meeting and we talk about stuff. Um, and sometimes that's an incredibly you know, useful iterative process. And other times I'm like, we've been talking about what this character should be named for two hours. Oh dear, what happened? Um, I, I, I would take away from that that like, don't, don't be afraid to ask for more like specifics if they're not giving you enough. Cause several times I, I've, I've had, I don't know if you've ever had the feedback. This is great. It just needs to be tweaked a bit more. It's like, okay, tw like, tw do you want me to like tweak the paper or what, you know, what, what, what do you want from me? Um, and, uh, the other thing is, uh, I, I actually am kind of a fan when, if there's multiple writers, if there's a little bit like, 
you know, each writer has their specific task. Like, you know, you're right, you're, you know, doing this project, you're doing this part of the project. As long as there's good communication between, you know, the writers, I think that can actually, you know, be a very handy way to do things because then, you know, you're not, you're not constantly iterating off each other, but you're able to give feedback to each other on your area of, of specialization. So I've, I've had good good experience. Yeah, Michelle, Michelle's right. We used to do that in the Fallout games where what we do is we actually uh, segment each area and give each area to a different writer so they wouldn't be stepping on each other's toes like that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Also, another thing I'd say, I in terms of iteration, I do prefer it when like, you know, one writer gets something out and then everybody builds on, you know, what that writer has done rather than, hey, we need this idea for this character and everybody provides their character idea because now it's like, well, now we've got to, you know, go through what everyone has done and figure out what we're going to do, which can be very interesting, but can also be a little time-consuming. So, and morally depressing. <laughs> yeah, those ideas didn't make it. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for the invaluable insight. Yep. Howdy. Hello. Hi. Um, so, Howdy. one of the things that I found in talking to a lot of students who want to get into game writing is that they really want to write games, and it's really hard for them to divorce sort of the game mechanic aspect of game writing to just look at good writing and interesting writing and really be excited from writing because they're not reading anything that isn't really a game and they just don't understand how those things connect. So I think it would be super duper valuable if you guys just talked about like what you've been reading recently, what's some really good writing you've discovered in just sort of in the last couple of months and throw that out so everybody knows what books they should buy and read after this conference. I just got done reading The Circle by Dave Eggers. I loved it. It was terrifying. So that's I recommend that one. I, I just started reading a book called Loosed Upon the World. It's a collection of short stories about environmental calamity <laughs> that she wrote a story in. It's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. I admit I tend to have my favorites that I keep coming back to and, and will basically foist on anyone who asks me, like, which book should I be reading? And one of them is, frankly, I reread Pride and Prejudice at least once a year. I love that book to death. Um, and uh, actually, the one of the one of the best books I've read also in terms of interesting, like, integrating the research about a time period into the story was um, Pillars of the Earth, which is a novel by Ken Follett about cathedral building in medieval England, and it's just it's got a riveting story, and it's like, it, but clearly he wants you to know he knows that he learned a lot about cathedral building, so really good you know uh, integration of the plot with the research that way. Uh I, I read uh, Steinbeck's uh, *East of Eden* recently, very long book, and just a class, some, one of the classics that kind of passed me by. I didn't, I didn't catch it the first time when I, you know, it was a school or whatever. They didn't have it, so I checked that out. And then I, now I'm reading a Fred Saberhagen book yeah. called, called uh, yeah, *Empire of the East*. So I have an East theme, and I'm working in the East right now. So it's a very East-based uh, theme going right now. Uh, but yeah, your your point is 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 taken that that you know you you uh, it's it's. It's important to have influences outside the industry, just like it's important to have a, you know a, a rich tapestry to draw upon and different influences, not not just books, but you know uh, movies and classic movie, you know movies, great movies and great TV shows, and just have a variety of things you can draw upon. But I, I had two sort of on that tip quickly, two interview questions that that I would use to rule people out. One was. Um, name some games that are well written, and I would find a lot of writers who weren't game writers would say they're all terrible. They're out just because they're not paying attention, right? Like, sure, a lot of games are badly written, but there are some good ones. Have you spent any time investigating it? And then the other one was, oh, great, your game stuff is good. What else are you reading? What else are you doing? It's like, oh, well, I read the Halo novel and the thing, and there's nothing wrong with the Halo novel, and that's all fine. But if they're so insular in that world, it's sort of uh, like this is going to. They're not. They're not broad enough in their knowledge. Exactly what you're saying, basically. So. Well, and I, I had one, but I, I hope manga counts. Um, and I'm going to butcher the title, uh, Nijigahara Holograph, which is very David Lynchian and a, a very interesting style, very beautiful. So, uh, I, I sort of have a reverse perspective where um, I punish myself whenever I'm not writing by watching Star Trek Voyager. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I usually find within 20 minutes I go back to writing. Uh, <laughs> But, and uh, the only nonfiction I'm reading right now is Proof, the Science of Booze, um, which was fascinating. But uh, what I actually do is I actually uh, do reading in the reverse in the sense that, so for example, when I was writing on uh, Wasteland 2, I wanted to do like the Agricultural Center 
because I really liked that location in the first game. But then once I realized I was going to be like writing an agricultural center that had grown out of control, I immediately went to the internet and I'm like, well, what, what are all the popular sources of fiction that have already covered this topic? So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to watch Day of the Triffids. I'm going to read Day of the Triffids. Like I'm, I'm going to go read like, you know, Food of the Gods, like all those aspects. Like, cause I want to, I want to, I want to be aware of the range of connections I can possibly draw and also be aware of the connections that I don't want to draw because some other source has already covered it already. So that I, I sometimes approach reading in reverse, but it's very specific to what I'm writing on. Hi, uh, my name's Bridget. I'm from New Zealand. I'm working on a large transmedia project for young girls, 8 to 12 year olds, uh, which sits on the core platforms of TV, books, and gaming. Um, and it's the gaming part I'm here for, obviously. Uh, so my question is, um, do you have any thoughts or resources or um, anything in terms of writing for children. I think young girls, 8 to 12 year olds, are very, it's a very specific time. It's a really precious end of childhood, not quite, not quite adolescence. And, and my whole project is all about capturing the, the innocence and the, the joy and the wonder of childhood. And so in terms of writing, that's always my focus. I come from a writing background. I'm a film and TV person originally. So yeah, any thoughts on that would be really cool. Yeah, actually, eight of my nine titles were for children between the ages of 11 and 15. Fantastic. And what I found was it would be really easy to write in a way that, like, talks down to them. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was two things. One was focus groups, focus groups, focus groups, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, find out how they feel about the things that you're doing and whether they fly or not. And Because kids, they can smell bullshit from, oh, yeah. from really <laughs> far away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they are not shy about telling you what they like and what they don't like. Yeah. And so focus groups are really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but the first game that I worked on was for 11 to 14-year-old African-American children. And I'm about as far away from a 12-year-old <laughs> black girl as one gets. Uh -huh. And I went into the project really recognizing that and wanting to do it right. So what I did was I wrote the outlines of the story, and then we went to a boys and girls club where there actually were kids in this demographic who, who the, you know, the stories were for, and we had them act out the stories. And so a Beautiful. lot of the phraseology that I borrowed from when I wrote that dialogue was from when those kids were acting the stories out, so yeah, that it was being it. done in a way that was you know, not going to mm. be patronizing or offensive or anything like that. It was yeah. just, my, my suggestion would be to include the kids yeah, in the process. Yeah, that's really cool. I was a qualitative researcher in a previous incarnation, yeah. so I, I, I respond well to that. Thank you. I, I'd second that. The, uh, I usually find, however, that the, uh, the focus groups will come to me because all my friends have, have uh, kids within that age range, and they'll immediately start pitching games to me about dragons and unicorns. And, they're all, and actually, it's like 10 times better than anything I could think of. I'm like, wow, this is great. Uh -huh. But uh, it, it often becomes an excuse to go meet and hang out with them. And then I just listen to what the kids are talking about. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty great. Well, that's going to make me rich for a year. <laughs> I've, I've written for children. I've also written for children's games. And you had a very interesting age range there, 8 to 12, mm -hmm. uh, because there's a huge difference in maturity and interest between eight-year-olds and 12-year-olds, and also like the technical aspect of it, because writing for kids, um, I, I don't know if you have reading level requirements. So, you know, you have 12-year-olds, but it's going to have to be on the reading level for eight-year-olds. So that's going to be an issue, too. It's got to be interesting enough for 12-year-olds, but it, the, the language can't be so simple um, that they're not interested in it. But at the same time, it can't be so complex that the 8-year-olds can't get into it as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good point. And I guess the, the one thing I would add is um, I don't have any experience doing this at all, so don't listen to my opinion on that. But the nightmare scenario to be in and to watch out for maybe is if you have, say, a member of the team or an executive who's got power over the project who has a kid who's this particular age and suddenly they are the demographic, just that one child oh, yeah. and then it just can become a nightmare scenario of like, well, Bobby doesn't like it and like, well, yeah, but these other 20 kids did like, doesn't, and you yeah. Bobby, Bobby doesn't like you either. Data. Bobby wants you fired. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So just be wary of that sort of personal, because yeah. you, know, you know, like an executive will be really close to their kid and suddenly they're running your project secretly behind the scenes or something like that. I'm always so, convinced they are anyway. Though, <laughs> yeah, you know? true. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I'm 
a writer, but I currently work in monetization for a free-to-play game, and I am going to be transitioning into uh, game design and more writing uh, on free-to-play games soon. Um, so my questions are kind of based on that. Um, I kind of have like two facets to the question. Uh, one is like general tips for writing uh, to free-to-play games, uh, where where you can use it is a lot more restrictive and. Also, um, the game's established, so it's you kind of have to like squeeze it in. Um, tips for that, and also uh, tips for writing for a game that has like the buildup of a narrative, but based on the way that free-to-play games are, it probably will never have like an ending point because you know the levels just keep going on. Um, so tips for both of those things. So I'm going to say something that's going to crush the hearts of all the writers in the room, but always make the narrative bit skippable. Uh, because, you know, a lot of people are playing in short stretches. They are playing the mobile game because they'll just have a little bit of time. And so they don't have time for a lot of story. They want to get right to the gameplay. The other thing is think about uh, mobile games as bits of story. And, like, you sprinkle that in. Um, it doesn't have to be after every level necessarily. Um, if you have dialogue, it needs to be super short. We talked about less is more. Less is really, really, really more <laughs> um, with mobile games. And also think about smartphone screens instead of tablet screens um, because you can play the same games on the phone and the tablet, but the smartphone screen is going to be a lot more restrictive. So write for the smartphone and not for the tablet. Um, I, I have actually been working on some uh, uh, free-to-play games at the moment, and, and I'm also doing a, a sort of a career transition at the moment. Um, my the one thing I've been trying to do is, whenever possible, like you know, for example, you've, you've got for most of these free-to-play games, you might have, for example, a, res a, a you know a, a resource that you know is going to be purchased through you know real-world dollars. I've actually tried to make an effort to actually like integrate that within the story that it makes sense in a way. Like, you know, for example, okay, well, you're collecting this, this, you know, maybe you're collecting stars and then there are these special stars that, yes, you do need to pay money for. So I've, I've tried to make it so that it feels like the getting the more powerful resource is actually a part of the narrative of the game. Um, Another thing I've done, I've, I've, I have been trying to do exactly what Toya says and keep and keep the the, the writing short. I, I don't know how well I've succeeded, um, but uh, yeah, definitely keep it skippable um, and make. I, I would actually say one thing I would definitely do is try to give the NPCs as much flavor within that small amount as you can because I've, I, I tried several free-to-play games in the genre I'm writing it and I'm like, this is just like, yeah, there's a person, there's a character popping up and they are literally just giving me exposition and tutorial text and I'm feeling nothing for who this person is. Like, I know you're Kate Upton. I don't know what you, what, who are you? What are you doing here? Um, so I, I would definitely see what you can do to make those, make, make the way that you're delivering the tutorial and the instruction like interesting on a character level as well. I'm going to bring the room down even further and say that if you're going to work on a free-to-play game, uh, also don't sign a non-compete clause where you can't give advice about how to design or write for free-to-play games for a year after you leave a company. But in a completely unrelated topic, I've been playing this incredible game called Dungeon Boss, which doesn't have a lot of text, but there's a story involved there. Hypothetically, it's just crazy. Um, the, uh, and the amount that they get away with, with just the naming of the abilities for each character, tells a ton about each character, as well as the animation set they have. Like, they have this one goblin who does a lot of, like, cheap shots, and, like, obviously, like, he's a dirty fighter, but then... They also have his animation set where, like, he's kind of a pyromaniac, but he ends up, he, his attack move is he actually, he accidentally sets himself on fire, and then he runs around screaming the entire screen, but he, he burns all the enemies while he's doing it. <laughs> that alone tells me five million words about that character right there. So look for ways of animation, uh, even the names of abilities, even the visual effects of how they're presented. That, that can be almost your entire story right there, depending on the presentation, and it requires no words whatsoever. Well, another thing, uh, I was reminded when Michelle was talking about the dialogue, 
if you can get a range of character portraits and emotional states for like say one character maybe you can have up to four emotional states so you can um, you can match the emotional state with the dialogue because uh, usually you don't have voiceover but if you can show like like a neutral state happy frustrated angry sad that that visual helps a lot too with, with regard to your question about a story that never ends mm-hmm. right uh, think think about uh, TV writing and the way that they just perpetuate character arcs. And of course, it's much broader and a much larger stage than what you're talking about, so you'll have to scale it down. But finding out what happens to this character over this arc, and then as that's resolving, another arc starts with a different character, for example, so you can always have something on the go endlessly, as opposed to a big three-act structure with we're leading toward a, a giant climax that never comes because we can't resolve the story, right? Mm-hmm. So you want to focus more maybe on character arcs and things resolving on a small scale and overlapping with each other. Again, very much a small stage to do it, but there, is, there are ways to, to, to kind of thread those things through. You could think of it as a soap opera model. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. think of it in terms of a soap opera. You know, the things are blowing up with this character and just before it resolves something else happens with it. now this one's been diagnosed right. with some horrible disease <laughs> and, and the episode always ends with like you know I know exactly what you're about to tell me and then like goes you know you, you have to wait till tomorrow and then they're like oh you're going to tell me that you're you know going out to the store to buy some milk it's like so well, you, don't, can, you can wait till tomorrow or pay five dollars to, to find out right, right now what <laughs> exactly um, and actually that, that also brings up something I, I kind of wanted to say and, and, and maybe I'm going to get like you know uh, attacked by rabbit writers um it doesn't always have to be shakespeare like it, it's it's okay to occasionally look at something and be like it's okay to write a you know a very silly story like uh, you can still write a silly story and still put quality and effort into it but like i remember i had you know one project where i was beating myself up about like why am i not like integrating all of these like deep artistic issues and like kind of had to come to peace with like it's it's not that type of game it would feel you know it would feel kind of forced if I was trying to do it. It's, it's working better as a narrative to do it this way, even though it's a bit of a silly fantasy story, and that's okay. I spent most of my time on the Orion Trail Project giving people space diarrhea. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to get to the last three. Do we have time for the last three? Oh, but thank, thank you so oh, much. Sorry. We have five minutes, so we'll try to get to your questions. Yeah. Hi, I'm a novelist, um, but in the publishing industry's own words, uh, it's adult fiction is anemic and insignificant, so I'm very interested in getting into games. Um, So I've made a couple game proposals for my published and unpublished books. Uh, I made a couple text adventures for my website, but with an eye to the job fair tomorrow. Um, I'm curious about how I ought to present myself. Um, I doubt that I'm going to be brought on board with the AAA game to be the lead designer. That doesn't make any sense. But um, with so many companies, um, and I, I, there's games that I like, but there's many more companies making good stuff. Um, I'm curious what advice you might have as to how I might match up with a good team and how I ought to present myself to them. What, what's your interest in being a game writer? Like why, why do you want to be a game writer? Well, it, it seems that um, the way people, people always want to get stories. People love stories. Mm-hmm. Um, but people aren't getting them from books. Um, games have a unique <coughs> interactivity. Um, and be able, but being able to blend uh, cinematic qualities um, of sound and character design and all that, um, it seems like a great new meeting. We've been waiting for, there was a hypertext, and that was supposed to be the next thing in storytelling, and that didn't take off because it's not fun to play, and the writing wasn't really up to uh, what it needed to be. So I'm, I'm interested in being on the winning side of things. Okay, because whenever I talk to someone who's from, a writer from another, another industry, I ask them why, and, and do they play a lot of games, and what games do they play, and you know, is it, is it just seeing, uh, is, is, it a, is it a question of you're passionate about games and you love games, you love playing games and you're interested in learning about game mechanics and getting really hip deep in that because that's, that's there's probably no harder, I mean it's you know, uh, Rihanna was just saying next door that writing in games is like writing in a headwind compared to other media yeah. it is just that much more challenging because there's so many more complications and so 
you've got to have that passion. You've got to have that interest in getting really into Excel spreadsheets and and, and tools and take the technology. Not necessarily being coming a programmer, but understanding what programs do and how the, and and what they can and can't do. And there's so much involved. So. If my, my, my core advice is, is you need to really be passionate about games. It can't just be you see this as a frontier <laughs> as a writer and you feel like you should be there. It's more like you should be passionate about being there because you're competing with those who are passionate and, and do play a lot of games and understand how games are made. So that's, that's well, the top level. Discovering the Telltale games really opened up my mind to the possibilities. Um, I used to take apart Choose Your Own Adventure books like a budding engineer would take apart a vacuum cleaner to see how they worked. And seeing this now finally come to fruition, um, I thought, I really love this, and I think I could do this, and I would like to do this. And I definitely think start with that as your pitch for yourself of saying, like, I really got into Telltale Games, and I realized this is cool, not, oh, I used to be a writer, and obviously that's dying, so oh, where should I go now? <laughs> right. You know, that's, uh, that's just not, to be honest, that's, that's going to turn off certain people who are like, well, forget this guy. And I would think for your meetings this week where you're pitching your own properties that you own, you know, should really view it as an entree into a conversation about what they actually need written, maybe, and not like think think of it like maybe you'll maybe you'll get one of them interested in one of your properties or something like that. But it's kind of unlikely. Um, but it's more of like a look I can write, and I did this pitch on it that really looks like a game already or whatever, and shows that I get it and I'm really into it. And that oh, and you need this other thing written. Well, I could do that too. You know, and that's gonna I think a more likely scenario to work out. To be honest. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We'll try to get to the um, last two. Hello. I'll be really quick. Uh, I'm working as a narrative designer at the moment on my first game, and one of the things that I found challenging is I will write a lot, and the team obviously doesn't want to read it. <laughs> so I was just wondering, um, what are some tips and tricks and methods that you guys use to communicate your story and keep that across, or the team across, what the story is and how it's changing? Bullet and points like that. Bullet points, um, flow what, charts. What I do, like, like if, if it's uh, if, if it's something descriptive, it's, if it's something that animators and um, uh, artists are going to be using, I put all the descriptive stuff up front, and then the more detailed stuff later, because uh, I know they tend not to like to to like to read a whole lot. Uh, so you know, like the game designers, uh, the game writers, they can read the stuff that's at the end, but yep. keep stuff that's descriptive and um, up front and brief. Cool. Yeah, sometimes for projects, uh, it actually does like, just do a PowerPoint presentation of the main characters and like the plot lines. And, and, and it did involve a lot of flowcharts, but it also includes things like a lot of reference art for like, here's how, here's, here's some sources of inspiration for this character. Mm -hmm. So you know what I'm thinking about when I'm writing them. The artist doesn't have to actually do those specific reference images, but they understand where I'm coming from. So we can sort of meet somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And generally like, yeah, it's, 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 it's generally hard to get anyone else in the team to, to read a lot of text. Usually, when like asking for like a specific character look, often with artists, it was it's doing what Toya says, where you make a very brief list of bullet points, and then I dump a, dump a bunch of reference art in a folder on the net, and then they yep. go look at it and they meditate on it for a while, and they come back with a number of variations for that character. Exactly that. In any way you can dramatize the story, like a PowerPoint with with art, and you can act it out, and you can kind of dramatize it and get them excited, get up, on, get it, stand up, and use your hands, and really, if you were there with them, hmm. you know, that's going to draw them in much them more than a, any document probably and, will. And Evan, yeah, and Evan's right. Another way can, you can sort of dramatize it too is if some concept art is already done. I generally find that artists really get excited about a presentation when they see their images up being presented before the whole company, and they're like, "Oh, well, that's my art! Wow, that's, that's pretty cool." <laughs> And this is the final thought, you know, I have a friend, Liz England, who talks about writing with the audience in mind any document you create. Like, you shouldn't just write a design document. You should write one for the animator, one for the programmer, one for whatever. And she's doing a talk about this on Friday at 1.30 uh, cool. in this Rules of the Game session that you might want to check out because she talks about all the ways she's written different documents for every possible audience on the team. Awesome. Uh, some things that's worked for the team I'm working with is one, uh, whenever possible, they will actually try and embed a writer into uh, one of the, the other scrums so that there's someone not necessarily giving them documents but actually able to answer questions on the fly. And the other thing is, as weird as it sounds, we have a company newsletter where like, we have to break down, every scrum has to break down their three main points that's important for the rest of the scrums to, to, to know. And that's actually been really useful to like, you know, break it down in three points. This is what the rest of you need to know about what narrative is doing. Yeah. The, what, last question, and also really quickly, will be at the wrap-up room right across in 3022. 
Hi. Um, I am creating an immersive media game, and the, the thing that is bringing people through is a creation myth of how the world was created and our purpose here and saving the planet. And I've never created a game before. <laughs> and so my big question is, who do I need to bring on my team? Or what games would you point to and say, wow, you want to learn and study this? Um, but again, my big question is, is as, as I form this board of advisors and our team members, like, who would you recommend as like, good people to bring on? I can tell a story. I've never done it in the, in the form of a game before. Did you say you have never played a game before? Oh, I played a game before, what yes. You've you never story. made a game before. Okay, like, I've got a great story. I've yeah. never gamified it before. Oh, and so okay. we're looking at how do we gamify this so that people go through this game experience where they get to be a part of saving the world, you know? I would definitely bring on a narrative designer or two uh, to help you figure out how to integrate the, uh, the gameplay and the story. Uh, I mean, and, and especially because immersion is really important. Mm -hmm. So your narrative designer would figure out how not to break immersion. Yeah. And it's interesting that for a while there were a lot of, of movie games that were made like say, oh, the new Star Wars movie is coming out so we should have a game about that. And they would try to follow the same plot as the movie or whatever. And those were inevitably terrible because you really need to write the plot for your game, for your game, and not just like, oh, we've got this existing plot, we can apply it to whatever. So you'll see a lot of the successful adaptations these days mm -hmm. are really writing a pretty custom plot, maybe in the same world, same setting, some of the same characters, mm -hmm. but really changing it substantially. And that's where like a narrative designer could come in to help you structure mm -hmm. that. I was going to say you might want to expose yourself to a lot of different kinds of storytelling to see what you can draw from different things. Um, I recently was in Nashville and did an escape the room experience in Nashville. And you wouldn't necessarily think that there's story that has to take place with that, but there really is, right? And so, you know, maybe just play different types of games and see what kinds of things you're really drawn to and really work that you can draw from. Um, and you will find very quickly both what you really like and what you really don't. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say, like, definitely bring a narrative designer on board, but something you can also do for yourself to kind of, like, you know, get at least some of the beginnings of understanding, like, you know, how the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the way uh, game storytelling can work is to actually see if you can experiment and twine. Like, um, it's, it's admittedly that's a, that's a branching, a specific branching type of, of narrative, but I've actually found it's, it's a very good visualization of understanding how game style branching narrative works. Um, you know, cause, cause you might find, oh, I had this like one central plot line, but I want to have all, but you know, now there's all these like random branches that are going off into nowhere. I now need to write a new story for that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's actually, I think, a very good beginner way to kind of, well, be, maybe beginner is not quite the right word, but a, a good intro way to sort of wrap your brain around, um, you know, context-sensitive storytelling, really. And that's called Twine? Yeah, it's Twine. a free tool on the internet, and there are many very good tutorials for that on the internet as well. Um, and Twine, too, has actually gotten reasonably sophisticated with mm -hmm. the things that you can do with it, you know, with visuals and audio, and you can build systems into Twines now. It's pretty... It's, it's a pretty a, powerful free thing. And it's great for experimentation, too. Yeah. Thank right. you. Thank you guys so much for coming again. Uh, some of us will be in the wrap-up room, which is right across the hall. Thank you. Thank you.